Okay, so tonight we are talking about loops. And um, this module builds directly from module three. In module three, we learned how to make decisions. In module four, we're learning how to make decisions repeatedly. Um, so as you'll know over the next couple of weeks, my favorite topic in, topic in programming is code reusability. Um, it's my favorite topic because it helps us write more efficient code if we stick to the principles. It um, also allows you to have better control of your code. It makes code more maintainable because you write less lines of code. Um, so what is reusability? Well, first of all, it's not copying and pasting. All right, you're using loops and functions and objects to be able to use the same set of code again and again and again. And it reduces the amount of code you have to write and maintain. Now, why is that important? Because in the programming world, by the time your code gets to the, the maintenance phase, it can cost a lot of money. The comparisons are often done like this. If you find a mistake in requirements, it costs you a dollar to fix. If you find the mistakes in design, it costs you $10 to fix. If you find the mistake while you're coding or in development, it costs $100 to fix. If you find the code, once it's gotten to the client site, it if you find the uh, if you find an issue by the time it's gotten to the client site, it takes a thousand dollars to fix. So each time you go up by a factor, and so that's why code reusability is important. It affects my life. I don't want to have the same code in lots of different places because then I have to maintain it. Um, so tonight we have some new keywords and some new descriptions. Our first keyword is while, and this is the first way we're going to learn to make a decision repeatedly in Python. Then there is for, and this is another way to make decisions repeatedly in Python. And there are two different reasons. There's a reason to have while, and there's a reason to have a for loop. We are going to be introduced to the keyword in, and that checks the value is present in a sequence. I mean, we can use it against strings. We can do it all the time. But it's really important here in looping. We're going to learn about how to break, which actually stops the execution of the loop altogether. And we're going to learn about continue, which stops the execution uh, at a certain point and then lets it restart. So what do we have? We have two new concepts. We have the concept of iteration and the concept of a sentinel value. An iteration is one trip through a loop. That's all that it is. A sentinel value is a special value that determines a termination condition of the loop. Because if you don't have a loop that has a terminating condition, it will run forever. And it will chew up, at minimum, all the RAM in your system. So we have to be careful that we don't write infinite loops unless we're meaning to write them, unless we really, really want to write something that's supposed to run forever. So let's talk about while loops. While loops are the first form of loop that you're introduced to in Zybooks. And it is a loop that has to have a variable that allows it to, the, that the loop knows whether it's going to stop or go, whether it's going to be done uh, or whether it's going to keep going. So you have a test value. And the test or the, the test value is defined outside the loop. And it cannot be equal to the sentinel value. Now, the sentinel value is the value which you're going to test to say, should this loop stop execution? Just stop. Don't do it anymore. Um, and then you're going to have, at some point in time, the definition of your loop. Now, last week, we talked about if, elif, and else. And we talked about how you have an expression and a statement and a colon. We're expanding on that this week. 
the concepts that you learned last week about Boolean expressions still apply this week. They haven't changed. We're just learning how to do and evaluate Boolean expressions repeatedly. And it's important to learn as a programmer, but it's also important because your main control loop for your game is going to be a while loop. I'll say that again. Your main control loop for your game is going to be a while loop. When they talk about the control loop, this is what they're talking about. And I think I have in this module, I'll double check, I think I have kind of a basic, um, here's what a control loop is, here's kind of how you do it in, in more of um, the context of the game. So just like when we had if, we have while. While says to Python, I'm about to make a decision repeatedly. I'm about to execute a Boolean statement repeatedly. And then you'll see that it has a variable. That variable is the test variable, and that test variable is in this case being evaluated against the sentinel value. And the sentinel value is just the thing that says stop. Just stop the loop. Stop the execution, walk past the block, and we're done. Um, and just like the branches from last week, we have the test variable. We have a conditional operator. In this case, it's not equal to. And we have the character Q, which is our sentinel value. And of course, we have the colon because this is a Boolean statement. This is, sorry, yeah, this is a Boolean expression. And because it's a Boolean expression, we have to tell it when to stop, when, when Python is supposed to stop reading that expression. And that is done using the colon, just like it was last week in F if, else, and else. So here I have two lines of code. Now we talked a little bit last week about scope and I'm going to talk a little bit more this week about scope. So test equal go and while test is not equal q are both in the global scope. The statements below the while loop that are indented one are in, are in the local scope of the while loop. So just like if and elif and else have local scopes, while has a local scope. So it only ever executes when the Boolean expression at the top of the loop evaluates to true. And in this case, we have our print and our, uh, we have print input your format test um, so it's just a print statement. It's printing out what you input. And then I'm going to set my variable test to something that you're going to input. And if that input is anything else other than the single lowercase character Q, the test is just going to keep running. Um, now there, you see these arrows kind of all around test. So there's a reason that my variable inside the loop is called test. That is because I am allowing the user inside the loop to modify what will happen with the while loop. So the inside the while loop, in the local scope of the while loop, the test equals input a word or cue to quit is modifying a value that control a variable that controls the loop's behavior and that will allow me to break out of the loop if you're thinking about your game this is what's going to happen you're going to be able to say you know enter q to quit and they're going to take in q and you're going to test it against your variable that's inside the loop so here are a few um, rules. A sentinel is a, is a value which defines the exit condition of a loop. A while loop will execute until the sentinel value reaches the exit condition. In other words, it's very easy to set up a while loop that runs forever. And if you do that in Zybooks, Zybooks is going to give you an error and it's going to stop the running. So never test it. Um, like all conditional statements, a while statement must end with a colon. And
and we have simple while and while with a sentinel. And I'm going to go back and forth a little more this time than I did last time. Um, so here's just a simple while loop. Okay. And what I want to show you in this is the scope and where the scope of this while loop ends. So I'm going to go in to my handy dandy debugger. Let me edit the configuration. Um, hold on. Sorry, I should have this set up. SNHU, where are you? Four, module four. Uh, hold on. Simple while. There we go. Okay. So we're going to debug this. And I've got my breakpoint because debuggers and breakpoints are wonderful. And we have two variables here. We have something called cur power equal to and user care equal y. Now, in this case, I'm doing something a little different than was in the slide. In this case, I'm saying while user care is the same as the single lowercase character y, then I'm going to do something. And what am I going to do? I, well, What's in the local scope of the while loop are lines 5, 6, and 7. So I'm going to do 5, 6, and 7. What's not in the local scope of the while loop is line 9. Line 9 is left justified. It's at the same place, the column 1, as the while and as user care and cur power. So this Line 9 is going to print no matter what unless your program has a problem. So let's just run it. And so I'm going to go to my variables. I'm going to step over. I get cur power equal 2. And I get cur user is y. Now I'm saying while user care is the same as y. So my user care value is, in fact, y. And y is equal to y. That evaluates to true, because it has to evaluate to true, just like an if statement would. And then I'm going to step over. And I'm now going to say cur power equal cur power times 2. It's going to print cur power, which is 4. I'm going to input a user character. And we're going to run through this one more time. I'm going to input 5. So now I'm back up to the top of the while loop. My user character is no longer y. It is 5 now. So what I have done is I have said I have ended the loop by not entering a y. So I have said since 5 is not the same as lowercase y, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is I'm going to end the loop because this, X, this evaluates to false because 5 is not the same as y. So I'm done. So now I'm going to debug, well, debug it one more time. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have printed done. So I am now going to do this again. We're going to say cur power equal cur power times 2. I get 4. I'm going to crimp print cur power, and now it's going to say, hey, user, I want you to input something. So what am I going to input? Well, I'm going to input a lowercase y. I am back up at the top of the loop because you'll notice that I did all, of, I, I executed lines 5, 6, and 7, and then Python automatically took me back up to that while statement because since it knows that 5, 6, and 7 are in the local scope of the while loop, it has to go back and reevaluate the while loop. And it will continue to reevaluate the while loop until the while loop um, evaluates to false. The statement in the while loop evaluates to false. So I've put in y, so I'm still going to be true. Now cur power equal cur power times 2, so that's going to be 8. Cur power is just printed out as 8. Now I'm going to gather another user character. This time the user character I'm just going to put in as Q. 
I'm here, Q is not the same as Y. And I'm now back in the global scope. And I'm going to print done, and the program is done. So this is a very rudimentary uh, example of what you would need to do in your game. So let's go back and continue to play. Okay, hold on. Let's go to the next slide. So we're going to uh, follow the test real quick. And basically, I think I just did this in code, but test is go, which is not Q, so it's going to execute the code inside the while loop, which is print and test. I'm going to put in hello, because that's your lovely teacher down there. My iteration one is complete. Now, everything gets blanked out. Once I have, once I am done with the internals of that loop, unless it was created in the global scope, it goes away. Any variable you create in the local scope, they all go away. So I now have hello. Hello is not the same as Q. I'm going to print out hello. Your input is hello. And then I'm going to ask again, input a word or Q to quit. I'm going to input Q as test, so the value of test is 2. The second iteration is complete, so I'm back up to the top of the while loop. And Q is Q, so it now evaluates the false, so the loop stops. So that's just kind of a, a visual example of the same thing we just did in the debugger. All right. Each trip through the while loop is called an iteration. All right, so we're going to take a quick look at what a while loop looks like in a flowchart. So this is for the same example. I have my start, and then I'm going to have test equal go, because that's just an input. I'm going to say if test is not equal to Q, when that evaluates to true, I'm going to output test and ask for the user to input for test again. When test not equal to Q evaluates to false, I end. This is very simple, but you will notice the loop. You will notice, and you will also notice I didn't use the word while. So I'm using the word if here because that diamond is, in fact, a condition that I have to meet before I move on inside the loop. So, and it doesn't matter if it's a while or a for. The loops look the same in a flowchart. So if test is not equal to Q, if that evaluates to true, then I'm going to go to output, I'm going to go to input test, and I'm going to go back up to that condition, the check for that condition. That is, in fact, the loop. And sometimes students find it easier to visualize. So follow the test. Did I just? OK. So now we're going to run through this really quick through the flow chart. So I'm going to say if test equal go, if test is not equal to Q, if test not equal to Q is true, then I'm going to output test. I'm going to get some input. The teacher is going to say, OK, I just put in hello. I'm going up to the top of the loop. I'm going to test it again. Hello is not the same as Q, so I'm going to go down, and I'm going to say OK. Professor Lisa, input test. I'm in Q, put in Q. Q is um, equal to Q, so that test evaluates to false, and the program ends. OK, you can count with while. So right now, what we looked at in the last several slides was the ability for you to allow a user to change the outcome of the loop. That's what we just did, and that's what you want for your game. Because if you're in my class, I'm going to be playing your game. So you need to allow me to be able to change the outcome of the game based on what I'm doing. If I want to quit, I have to be able to quit. Um, so in counting, I have 
I have my test variable. In this case, case it's counter. And I'm setting counter to zero. I have my while statement. And I'm going to say while counter is less than three, I'm going to print it out. And I'm going to say counter. It, I'm going to now modify in the local scope of the loop the word counter. And sorry, the variable counter. And I'm going to set counter plus one. So I've just made counter. I've incremented counter. I've, I've just added one to it. And then I go back up to the top of the loop, and I do that until counter is no longer less than three. So there's a couple of important things here. I've defined the variable counter outside of the while loop. So it is not in the local scope. It is in the global scope of the program. I have, I have my test based on what the value of counter is, and I don't want it to go more than three iterations. That's what I'm telling it in that while loop line. Counter is zero, so when zero is less than three, I'm just going to print out what I, um, that counter is three, and then I'm going to go, and the last line here is incrementing the counter. If you forget this line, what will happen is that you'll have an infinite loop. And if you do that in Zybooks, it's going to give you this really weird timing error. So this, this is how you do this in a while loop. Don't forget that last line to increment the counter. And it will be much easier. So why did I just move to anatomy of a for loop? For loops were made for counting. Okay, I can do the exact same thing I did on the previous slide. And I can do it with fewer lines of code. And you know me, I like fewer lines of code. So what do I have on this slide? I have the word for, for is a keyword. Okay, it tells Python that it's going to make a series of decisions repeatedly. Just keep going back. Then I have num. Now you'll notice there's no variable definition that I have that's not that's on this page and that's not a mistake. With a for loop you don't have to define the variable in the global scope. Python does it for you by giving it a name. So I have for which is my keyword. Num is a variable name. That variable will exist only in the scope that is associated with that for loop. And then I have this keyword in. In just says, to the right of me, there is going to be a sequence. And you, I, I'm going to go through that sequence until there's nothing left in the sequence. Range is a special function, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later. And you read that line is, as long as num is less than 3, keep going. That's, that's how that line is red. And then I'm going to have print num is format num. So that is the line that is in the local scope. And that's it. There were more lines for a while loop than there is for a for loop. Now, one of the differences is you can't use a sentinel value with a for loop. So for loops are made for counting. They're made for any kind of a sequence. You'll we will use them a lot with dictionaries. We will use them with lists when we get to it. Um, I write more for loops than I write while loops in my code. But there is a specific purpose for a for loop and a specific purpose for a while loop. Your while loop allows a user to modify the what's happening in the program by inputting inside the loop, inside that while loop. You can't do that in a for loop. So whiles are for when a use, you want a user to modify what's happening in the loop. For is when you have a sequence. And range gives us that sequence. Um, OK, I think I just covered all of these. Oh, yeah, as always, the for statement has to end with a colon, or uh, Python won't let you run it. It'll just be mad at you. Okay, so let us go 
Let me go back. We're going to four with range. I'm just going to run a little code here. Four with range. And that's all. This is just two lines of code. Let me make that bigger. And we'll do four with range. So I have two lines of code here. Oh, and I apologize. This range, let me turn it to make this three for right now. So it looks like the other stuff. Um, so I have counter. This could have been num. It's just a variable name. That's all it is. I know it's a variable. Now, this is the one instance where you'll know it's a variable, but it's not because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. You will know that it is a variable because it is to the right of the for keyword. So for is always for variable, whatever the variable is, in and then a sequence. That sequence can be a list. In this case, it's the range function. Um, and so I'm just going to debug this. Now you'll notice there's no user input associated with this. For is all of a sudden, counter exists now. Counter is zero because range gives us a sequence. Zero, one, two is what the sequence it will give us for the way that that is. So I've now gone up to the top of the loop. My console has counter is zero. As soon as I step over line two, because I've just finished the first iteration, counter automatically goes to one, and that is because Python went to the next place in that sequence. And then I'm going to have counter is 2. So I'm going to print out counter is 2. Now it's going to say, OK, what's the next value in the sequence? Well, there is none. So my program ends. And let's just take a quick look at some errors. So this one, if I try and run it, I get syntax error, invalid syntax. And this is nice because it actually shows you on this error where the syntax is. And the syntax is that I just took off that colon. Um, and the other one, well, that's really for, what, for when we use range, that's really the only error you can do from a syntactical point. Well, there are more, but that we're going to talk about from a syntactical point. When we get to loops, I'll show you some more errors. But for this week, that's good. Oh, wait a minute. The other thing is this guy. Okay. Again, because you are dealing with global scope, the for loop is in the global scope, and then things in the local scope, if I um, left justify the print statement, I will get an error because Python is expecting line three to be indented one tab stop to tell it that print is in the local scope because you can't have a loop, a while loop or a for loop defined in Python in your code that does not have some form of local scope code. And right now this for loop doesn't have any local scope code because I just put print and backed it up to the left justification. So if I hit a tab, I'm OK. When I run it, I get counter is 0, 1, and 2, which is what I would expect. OK, so range. So we're going to talk about range and in. Range is a special function, OK? and it works with the keyword in. And all in does is says, determine if the value is contained in a sequence, and it's often used while iterating over a sequence. Um, there are other ways to do this, but this is really the most efficient way, um, and it's kind of a best practice in Python. The range function is a standard function, Python gives you this function. You don't have to do anything special. You don't have to import it. But it is a function, like print and input. So you have to give it arguments. And there is 
one required argument, which is the stop value, and two optional arguments, the start and the increment. So um, the stop is what we just saw. The stop was range with the three in it. Um, what does range do? What does the range function does? Well, it creates a sequence of numbers. You don't have to say, I have a sequence that starts at one and ends at three and make a, a list out of it. Range is going to do that for you, okay? And it always starts at zero unless you told it otherwise. It ends at range minus one. So whatever that stop value is, that required value is, it will be that value minus one where it will stop. So you'll notice in the last one, we had range as with three as the argument and you saw zero, one, and two. So you get three outputs, but the numbers were zero, one, and two because range stops at the stop value minus one. And range isn't gonna increment by one unless you tell it otherwise. So start tells it if it's gonna start someplace other than zero. Stop tells it where it's going to stop, minus 1. And the increment is if I don't want to go through each and every uh, iteration. Maybe you want to do odd even, or maybe you only want to look at every other line or every other thing that is coming in, and those are very reasonable things to expect. So we're going to follow the number with this. So no teacher needed. I have range is three. So this is what range does. It creates a sequence, zero, one, and two. So num becomes zero. I'm gonna print out num is zero. I'm going to now go back up to the top of that loop. So I've just done an iteration. And now I'm going to pull one from that sequence. And I'm gonna print out num, and then I'm going back up to the top of the loop. And now num is going to become 2. It's going to print out num is 2. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. And then I'm done. So that's a lot that goes on in two lines of code. I love for loops, and that's one of the reasons. OK, so let's look at this again quickly from a flowchart perspective. So we're going to have our start. We're going to have num equals zero. We're going to have if num is less than three. If that is true, then we're going to output num. We're going to increment num. And then if it's false, we're going to end. Now, this doesn't look a whole lot like, and then there is the loop. Sorry, this doesn't look a whole lot, A, different from the while loop. But B, it doesn't look like the code from the last slide. And that is because flowcharts and pseudocode are language agnostic. I should be able to take what's in your flowchart or what's in your pseudocode and apply it to different languages. So that is why this pretty much looks like the same format for a flowchart for the while loop. So I didn't want you guys to go in and look at flowcharts and say, well, because it looks like this is a while loop, it's not necessarily that it would be a while loop or a for loop. A flowchart is language agnostic, so that means it won't look any different. And you, the programmer, get to choose the best implementation. Okay, a little bit more about range. So you're probably going to have a lab where you're going to have to deal with Something other than just range being a just, you know, 0, 1, 2. So I want to print every other number between 1 and 5, inclusive of 5. So how do I write my for loop? Well, I'm going to start with a for keyword. I'm going to give it a variable name. That variable name currently is num. It doesn't have to be. It could be counter. It could be Fred. It doesn't matter. It's just the name of a variable, just a storage space. I'm going to have my keyword in, and then I'm going to have range. I'm going to have a function call range. I'm going to say start at 1, stop at 6 minus 1, which is 5, and do it and increment num by 2. So what range does 
is it does just that, and it creates me a sequence of 1, 3, and 5. So I'm going to just do this real quick. We're going to print that num is, we've seen this before, num is 1. We go up to the top of the loop. Number 1 is done. We do 3 now. Num is 3. We go up to the top of the loop. We grab 5, and it's 5. So that is a way to use range that allows you to skip values, allows you to do only odd values, or potentially only even values if you needed to. So nested loops, OK? Um, you will write a lot of nested loops in your, in your life as a programmer. And you're probably going to need some nested loops for the lab this week. And I promise we will go over the labs. So this happens to be challenge 4.13. And it says, given the number of rows and the number of columns, write nested loops to print a rectangle. So first, I'm going to define have you, the user, define my number of rows. And you, the user, define my number of columns. Now, since there's a user input here, you would think this is going to be a while loop solution. But it's not. And it's not because I'm simply counting here. I'm not asking the user to change anything inside the local scope of any of these loops. And you'll notice there are two loops. So there are two local scopes. There is the local scope for the outermost loop and a different local scope for the innermost loop. Um, and the code is for outer in range rows. For inner in range columns, I'm going to print a star. And then I'm going to end that with a space because I don't want a new line. And this, this comes from chapter one, I can't remember, chapter one or chapter two, where we're learning how to use print without having it automatically do a new line. And this is important, and this looks like one of the problems you're going to have to uh, one of your labs from this week. And then after I'm done with that inner loop, then I'm going to print, just call print for a new line. So if I am Professor Lisa and I'm going to say rows is two, I'm going to say columns is two. So if you look over to the right side, it says start outer equals zero. So outer is my variable. I have four outer in range rows. So I know that rows is the stop value. So I also know that range is only going to create a 0 and a 1, because rows is 2, and the, the stop value is always for range, the stop value minus 1. So it will be 2 minus 1, so it's just going to create 0 and 1 in the sequence. The same thing goes with columns. It's just a different variable. And so I have my outer for loop, which is going to get evaluated. And then I have an inner for loop. Now this inner for loop, the print statement underneath it, and the print statement that's left justified with the inner for loop are all in the local scope of the outer for loop. Now when I step, when I now evaluate for inner in range columns, I go in, so I've got start, enter is 0. I then go into the local scope that is only valid for the inner for loop. And I know this seems like a lot, but it really is a step. It's just one step, and then another step into another scope, and then you unwind those steps. So we're going to unwind to go back out to the um, outer for loop in a, in a few minutes, and then we're going to unwind when we're done. So I'm going to print a star. Now my inner is 0, and my range is going to be 0 and 1. So I'm going to go back up to the top of the inner loop, and I'm going to evaluate because inner is 0 plus 1, which is 1, which is less than 2. So I'm now going to print out another star. I'm going to go back up to the top of the inner loop. And I'm going to say, wait a minute, inner is 1 plus 1, which is 2, which means that I'm all done. 
because inner will not be in range. Two is not in range because it would be zero and one because I'm only giving it the end, the stop value, and it's stop value minus one. So then I go and I print. Now, this print statement is only going to do a new line. However, it is in the scope of the outer for loop. So I have come back into the scope of the outer for loop. I go back up to the top. And now I'm evaluating the, the, the for loop, the outer for loop again. You'll notice that all of the column stuff was only done for the two lines for inner in range columns and the print underneath it. Okay, this is the first time I've gone back to the outer for loop. So I'm going to start everything again from this for loop. Now, I'm changing the counter. I'm changing outer, sorry, in the outer for loop. So now counter is going to be 1 because it automatically increments. My inner is going to start again at 0 because it's like that not line never got um, executed before because it was all cleared out when I got to the outer for loop. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to do my thing and I'm going to print out another star and then I'm going to go print out another star. I'm now going to print out a new line. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop and I'm done. So that is what a nested loop looks like and that is how it works. You, assuming that you meet the condition for the outer for loop, you then go in and you execute the inner for loop and you run around that inner for loop until you're all done. And then when you're all done, Python will take you back out to the outer for loop and clear out anything that was in the local scope of that inner for loop. And then you'll do it all again. So that is what's important for nested loops. What time is it? Okay. All right, so we have break and continue we're about to talk about. Now, this is a while loop, and I made this a while loop on purpose because you might have to do breaking in your game. You might not, but you might. So I have a test value that's just the empty space. And I'm going to have while test is not equal to done. I'm going to have the user input, what is the answer? I'm going to say if the answer is time, then, I, you know, if I don't have a clock, if the answer is 42, um, then print right answer and break, and else print try again or done to stop, print done. So this is, I'm going to actually just do this one because we're getting low on time. I'm just going to do this one in uh, Python. So, break. Break. Okay. So, we just looked at this, and what, we're, what I want to do is I want to kind of show the flow of what happens when you have conditional variables, when you have if, elif, and else inside of a loop. Now, the if, elif, and else could have also been inside of a for loop, but this is partly important because this is going to be similar to the structure of your game. And I start talking about your game now, even though it's not due till week seven, because there are going to be various pieces that you have to pick up along the way to make that game successful. And this is one of the first of those pieces. So I'm going to debug. All right, so test is just space. So I'm going to say if test is not equal to done, and I like PyCharm with this because I can just mouse over the relational operator, and it will tell me whether it's true or false. So test is not the same as done. So I'm going to step over. And there's my variables. And I'm going to ask, what is the answer? And so let me just put in time, and I put in time, and it says I don't have a clock, 
So it's going to print that out. It's going to print done, and now I'm back up at the top of the loop. Okay, and actually this done isn't in the right spot, but I'll move it. So test, what's test now? Test is time. Time is not the same as done. So it's going to ask me what the answer is. And, um, oh, I don't have my break here. I'm sorry. Let's, let me correct this. The right answer is 42, and I'm going to break. Okay. So let me start this again. My apologies. So I, test is not done, so I'm going to input test. I'm going to do this as this time I'm going to put in ABC. ABC is not time. It's not 42, so I'm going to print try again or done to stop. So now I'm here. What is the answer? I'm going to make the answer 42. 42 is not the same as test, so it won't print. I don't have a clock. 42 is in test, so it's going to say right answer. Now break is going to stop the execution of the while loop. And when it does that, it's going to fall to the next line in the global scope. So right now that break is on the inner scope. So it's on the inner scope of the while and the, in, sorry, the local scope of the while plus the local scope of the LM. So I'm going to say break. It doesn't go back up to the top of the loop at all. It falls out to the next line in the global, global scope and that's print. So I'm going to run, run this one more time. Do I want to run it one more time? Uh, no, I think we're good. I think we have everything we need from that. Okay. So we have continue. Now continue is very similar to break. And what continue does is continue just says, I don't want to do anything else. But I do want to go back up to the top of the loop. So I don't want to stop everything. But I want to go back up to the top of the loop and... Um, I want to reevaluate from the top of the loop down. Now this will be important. Um, if you have a while loop and your answer is potentially invalid for your game, you're going to want to use continue if your, your user is giving you an invalid input. So let's just look at this. I have I created a variable Meister. I know Meister is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Meister is 1 and 2 and 3. So now I'm going to split it. And when I split it, I get a list that's 1, comma, and, comma, 2, comma, and, comma, 3. And I did forget the quotes around 1, 2, and 3, and I apologize. So now I have a for loop, and I have four item in my list. Now this is a little different because I am using a list. We've talked a little bit about lists when we were talking about strings. And this is just an example we have. And what I have here is I have a sequence. I have a sequence of strings. So I'm going to say my first, well, inside the local scope is an if and an else, OK? My item is going to be 1. And my item, in this case, is not and, it's a one. So I'm going to continue because I don't want to do anything. Sorry, I'm not going to continue. I'm going to step to the else because item is not the same as and. So I'm going to go else and I'm going to print the item and I'm going to print a comma. And then I'm going to go back up to the top of my loop and everything else goes away. Item is now and, so I go in and I look, I evaluate if it's and, so item is and, and I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop, but I'm not going to print anything out. Now item is two, I'm going to go through the loop again, I'm going to print out the item, I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop, and is now the item because it just got replaced. I'm going to evaluate and against item. I'm going to continue, go back up to the top of the loop. I ignore everything else. 
And now I have my last value in the sequence, which is 3. I'm going to test item. I'm going to test 3 against and. 3 is not and. So I'm going to print it out, and then I'm done. And that's how continue works differently than um, break. So continue says go back up to the top of the loop. Break says stop all execution. So now we'll go into the labs, and then I can answer any questions. We can go through any other examples or tests that you want. Um, so this is, given a line of text as input, output the number of characters excluding spaces, periods, or commas. So this is one of those where you're going to have text as input. You can use that as a sequence. Um, and if you have a sequence, for loop is the best one to use. And also there's no, the user doesn't need to change this inside the running loop. So you're pretty good with a for loop on 4.14. And somebody's going to input a string. And then um, now I say counter equals zero because this is language agnostic. And I'm going to say if, if less than length of string, so we're not at the, the outer length of the string, then I'm going to go in and I'm going to look and say is 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 it is the character a space? Is it are the, is the character not equal to a space? If it's not equal to a dot, and if it's not equal to a character, then we're just going to increment the counter. If either of those or any of those are false, then we're not going to increment the counter, and we're going to go back up and ask the question again at the top of the loop. And at the end, we're going to output counter. So that's all it is. This is a, a loop. The loop is going to have an if, elif, and elif conditions. It's not going to have an else. Um, I'm sorry, it is going to have an else. Yeah. And you're just going to increment a counter based on the fact that it's not a space, it's not a dot, and it's not a comma. Lab 4.15, and boy, I apologize for this one. Do I have anything else going on here? Yes. I apologize, don't know what happened to this guy. So we're just going to print it all out. This is similar to the last one. However, boy, I apologize. Let's escape. All right, let's just do this one. We'll make it bigger. I don't know what happened to it. So let's make this bigger. I think you can see that. So lab 4.15 seems kind of difficult. And it seems more in-depth, and it is somewhat more in-depth, but it still follows the same pattern that we just saw and the same pattern that we've seen before. I have somebody inputting a word, and I'm going to create a password out of that. Now, there's a different little difference here because the user input's outside, so I probably can assume that it's a for loop. Um, at, but I have this password variable that's also created outside of the loop that I'm going to do. And that's because I want to use it later. If I want to use it outside the local scope of a loop, I have to define it outside of the local scope. So I have to define it in the global scope. So the password or any other variable you're going to use in the global scope has to be defined in the global scope. So basically what I'm just going to do is I'm going to say is the counter less than the length of word. If that's true, then I'm going to go through and I'm going to follow the instructions on how to create the password. So I becomes an exclamation point, A becomes an at, M becomes capital, B becomes eight, and zero becomes, or O becomes a dot. And I'm just going to just simply do a, a letter replacement, and I'm going to increment, I'm going to basically add the letters on to the password. And because I'm only dealing with strings, I can do that. And I'm just going to go through this for every single letter, and I'm going to create my passwords based on what the user input. But the user in is not changing anything inside the loop. Um, I don't know why that slide is there. Lab 4.16. Um, 
You want to you want to output a right triangle based on the user specified height and the triangle character. So basically, I'm going to start the the top of my for loop. The first thing it's going to do is print out one of the character, and it's going to continue to print out more characters until it gets to the total number that I put in. So I'm going to input a care, I'm going to input a height. Um, I look at this loop and I don't see the need for a while loop, I see the need for a for loop. Um, so if the counter is less than or equal to height, then we go. If the counter is not, then we stop. I now have an inner loop. So this is telling, this flow chart is telling me we have an outer loop and an inner loop. In the inner loop, I'm going to go through and I'm using the same counter. If inner is less than counter, then I'm going to output the character. I'm going to increment inner. I'm going to go back up and check it. If inner is less, uh, sorry, if inner at any time becomes greater than counter, I'm going to say false, I'm going to increment counter, and I'm going to go back up to the, out, the outer loop, and I'm going to do it all again. So 4.16 requires nested loops. So go back and look at the examples for nested loops. Now, we also can go over the pseudocode for this, but I will also have the pseudocode up on, uh, um, on the YouTube channel. I know this is, again, a lot to cover. Do, does anybody have any questions? Is there anything you guys would like to see me cover? It's okay to raise your hand, un undo the mic, whatever you would like to do. Okay. Okay, Michaela, you can type it in here, or you can um, unmute your mic. It's up to you. I'm assuming you're typing in Michaela, and that's fine. Okay, so break differs from the part of the if statement providing true. So I think what you're talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, uh, which one is this? Break and continue. Break and continue. So, okay, so this is break, and we have an if statement for the break. Um, and so what we're looking at here is I want to actually let me bring it up here because I think it will be easier to read. So what is happening is the break is telling it to stop, but it's telling it to stop based on the evaluation of a condition. So break is just the action. It just says stop here. Don't go back up to the top of the loop. You know, move out into the global scope. The condition is what the the condition here of this L if is just that. It's just a conditional statement. If it evaluates to true, I go in and I deal with what is in the local scope of that conditional statement. And in this case, I've told it to break. I could have told it to break after line five if that was the correct behavior for my program. So the conditional statement, the break is not a conditional statement. Break is simply an action that stops the behavior of the loop. It basically says just stop the loop now. Don't go back up to the top of the loop. Just end it and fall out to the next line the next statement in the global scope. Did that answer your question? Okay, once ELIF runs, wouldn't it go to print anyway? Yes, it will. If, if this, so 
let me let me explain it by showing because I think I must not have done that well. So this while loop, okay, has a control which is done, and it has a value which is test. Test is um, is changeable inside the loop. So inside the local scope, I am changing the value of the variable test to something that I want. So eventually, if if somebody actually prints done, then it will, you know, puts done in there, then it will print done. But if I am a user and I never type in the word done, I'm never getting to line 11. I will be inside this loop for the rest of my life. So this is where scope becomes important because what's highlighted in blue right now is only ever going to be executed if you are inside the loop. And now to further that, if I am what is highlighted right now, line five, is only ever going to be executed when the word time is in the input from the user, which is, in, which is contained in the variable test. The same with 7 and 8. The only time 7 and 8 are going to be executed is when 42 is contained in the value that is stored in the variable test. So the only time the break is, is executed is when 42 is in test. And then we have this else and this else just prints try again. But line 11 will only be executed when we are no longer potentially doing any of these. Does that help, Michaela? If not, we can run through it. Can while loops work a bit like infinite loop then, hence the use of break? Yes, while loops can very much be an infinite loop. Uh, an infinite loop in a while loop is just this. Whoops, if I can spell, that's an infinite loop. While true. That will run forever. And it will chew up all your RAM and bad things will happen. Um, so that's why generally we teach that you have a variable and a sentinel value. Okay, do you want to run through this program a bit and see what happens as we run through it? Because we can run through it more than twice. We can run through this a bunch of times and then you can see how each of the conditions will behave. Because frankly, that's what I'm going to be doing <laughs> when I test your code. I'm going to look at the conditions you, write, you wrote I'm going to be determining if they are the correct conditions for you to check. And then I'm going to be putting values in to check those conditions positively and to check them negatively. Um, so do you want to run through this, Michaela, or do you think that you're good? Okay. Uh, no, if I change break to continue, well, yes, break to, in this particular instance, changing break to continue won't really have any effect because if I put a continue here, it's going to go back up to the top of the loop, but I don't need a continue there because once I'm out of this local scope, it's going to go back up to the top of the loop anyway. It's just going to go right back up to the while, and then it's going to say, okay, put in something user, and then it's going to check that input against all this stuff and it's going to go back up to the top of the loop until somebody puts done or I hit line 8. So good questions. Does anybody else have any questions? Going once. Okay. All right, Michaela, if you want to stay on the line afterwards, you can, and we can go through some things. 
If you don't, then uh, please, I know you're in my class, so please feel free to reach out to me. So going once, going twice, no problem, Cindy. I'm uh, glad that it helped. I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to end the meeting, and I hope everyone has a good evening.